Then we progress all the way to 15, 16. So now I'm jumping ahead all these years. It's a mess what happened from his time. Go back. It's a mess from what happened at this time all the way to 15, 16. The Texas Receptus. This is another what I call Book of Lies. Where did this come from? Erasmus. This guy here is a picture of Erasmus I've got here on the screen. The Texas Receptus was published by Desiderius Erasmus. Everybody calls him Erasmus. Erasmus is, didn't need to put an extra S there, but we keep moving. Erasmus's first edition was published in 1516, and he went on to produce several more editions. They were based on a small number of Byzantine manuscripts, but Erasmus had to rely on the Latin Vulgate. Now we're going to get another language involved for a few verses of the book of Revelation where he found the Greek manuscripts to be what? Incomplete. So the guy who did the big push on the Greek manuscripts is Erasmus. This is the big push. This is Christianity exploding now. From all this stuff, you hear about all this stuff with Christianity, y'all can thank Erasmus for it because he perpetuated the great hoax at an all-time high. And he's admitting, I didn't have a whole completeness in uh, Greek. I had to go grab from the Latin Vulgate, had to go mix it up. So I, and I, look, remember, 400,000 errors. Even at 1%, you're still dealing with 4,000 errors. And you got all these people trying to translate. So the Texas Receptus is now getting translated from the Greek over into the English. There you go. From the Greek over into the English based on the Greek. Nonsense. Nonsense. Then, after he made his big push, you got the majority text philosophy that came up. Now you have these other texts that were popping up from Greek. See all this Greek writing? They're popping up all over the place. Remember, 6,000 of these things out there? More lies. Now we got the majority text. And this is what you're going to hear. Pastors, uh, theologians, scholars, Theology schools, they're going to be leaning on the majority text. Oh, we can't go with the minority text. Can't go with those few select that all agree with each other. No, 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 no. We got to go with the majority text. Well, let's watch the nonsense. The majority text nonsense. The majority text, also known as the ecclesiastical or Byzantine text, compiles Greek New Testament manuscripts Here's how they do it, by favoring the reading present in the majority of them. So they're saying the majority of them, if they all are kind of lined up, we're going to favor them, all right? So if 100 manuscripts have one reading and 200 have another reading, well, then the 200 is selected, the latter is selected. Why? While <laughs> this majority rules method seemed like straightforward initially, it's crucial to consider these other aspects. For instance, let's say you go with the majority text uh, viewpoint and method, which I call nonsense. So for instance, if a Greek manuscript with errors is replicated a thousand times, those mistakes would outnumber a more accurate version replicated less frequently. So you see, if you got 200 manuscripts and they all agree with each other, but they all got the big mistakes in them, but they go, oh, these are all written the same, but they can all be written in all mistakes. They're going to say, all right, we're going to use that instead of the 100 that could be accurate. Nonsense. Can you say that with me? That's just nonsense. We want accurate. And why are we playing with this Greek stuff? Why? Now, when we take that compared to the Aramaic and the Hebrew, it's like shocking. Let's take the Peshitta, for example, for its consistency. Why do we want to guess and hope and wish on the, the Greek that's proven to have all these thousands of errors when we can get historical data like this? Check this out. The Peshitta an ancient version of the scriptures, i.e. Bible, in Aramaic, 
is renowned for the remarkable consistency across its 360 manuscripts. Pay attention to this. This consistency is especially astounding given the widespread geographical regions these texts have been found in and the vast time span over which they were produced. What does that mean right there? That's important to stop and capture that. What does that mean? It's saying that these scriptures were found in different countries, different regions, and they were found over a long different period of, of periods of time. I think it can mark as long as 1500 years apart. And when they go pull them all together, that, that they were finding them in different places, all 360 are virtually identical. See, that's the greater weight of the evidence right there. The uniformity of the Peshitta manuscript stands as a testament to the meticulous care taken by these scribes and the stringent standards they adhered to when copying these set-apart texts. Such remarkable uniformity provides scholars and readers with a high degree of confidence. See, I'm a scholar. So when I read stuff like that, and when I go study stuff like that, and then I go actually go start doing the translations, I get a high degree of confidence. You should too, regarding the preservation and transmission of the Peshitta's content. This level of coherence contrasts with the many other ancient textual traditions like Greek, whatnot, which often show a great degree of variance due to factors like scribal errors, errors, intentional edits, distortions, lies, right? Or regional variations. The Peshitta's consistency underscores its importance as a reliable witness to the ways of Yahuwah. That's important. That's critical.